everyone. Happy Sunday and welcome to Christ Community. It's good to see you guys. Um, I'm loving the weather. I'm loving it. I talk about the weather every week, but <laughs> today is the day. We've got like 60s out, bringing out the sweaters. This baby's going to be burning behind us here in a couple of weeks with Ty's permission. I did. I told somebody when I was leaving this afternoon, Ruby's going to want that stupid fireplace on this afternoon. Absolutely. Um, if you haven't yet, uh, help yourself to the refreshments in the back. Mike made chili to bless us this evening. Um, thank you for that. And we are going to get started with worship. So you guys are welcome to stand up and join us. eyes of men it seems there's so much we have lost as we look down the road where all the prodigals have walked and one by one the enemy has whispered lies and let them off their slaves But we know that you are God, yours is the victory. We know there is more to come that we may not yet see. So with the faith you've given us, we step into the valley unafraid. To dry bones come alive, come alive. We call out to dead hearts, come alive, come alive. About all the ashes that I see will be rise. As we call out to dry bones, come alive. God of endless mercy, God of unrelenting love, rescue every daughter, bring us back the wayward sons, and by your spirit breathe upon them, show the world that you alone can save, oh you alone can save. of God, now breathe the breath of God, breathe the breath of God, now breathe, breathe the breath of God, now breathe the breath of God, breathe the breath of God, now breathe, as we call out to dry bones, come alive. Good evening. Please be seated. Well, uh, yeah, Ruby stole my thunder. I have nothing else to talk about but the weather. So, um, I well, I say that we do have something to talk about. Uh, Chris and several people from our church are over in Israel right now. Uh, it's funny because uh, Chris was gone all week. He left. Wednesday, well, he left Tuesday at like 12.30 at night, so he left Wednesday morning. They were supposed to come back next Monday. They're 
I, I did hear, he did say that they have gotten uh, a flight back, but I'm not sure when it's coming back. But they, they're not even in Israel now, they're in Jordan. They got them across the, across the border, they got them out of harm's way. I've been talking to Chris a little bit, and our middle school youth minister, Johnny Lindsay, he's over there with them too, and I've been talking to him a lot more. And they're not scared about what's going on, they're just kind of put out that their trip got ruined so that's a good thing that they're not they're not worried but Chris being Chris he still wanted to do the greeting time <laughs> this morning so he sent me and Tara a video on Thursday and said here play Hi, this <laughs> I'm here in Caesarea on the sea and it's places where Paul traveled so often in fact Paul um, came and and brought Cornelius and his entire family to Christ here in this town Right by the Mediterranean. You can go ahead and take a picture of that. And so much of the uh, architecture is from the Roman times. The Romans had a city here that was almost 50,000 people. And Herod the Great built a lot of things here during the Roman time. And uh, we think up here there's a vault. And we think up here that uh, Paul was actually held in prison as he was on his way to Rome. So anyway, I just wanted to say hi where we were. And sh Rhonda, show you, show yourself. And I'll, I'll see you later. <laughs> yeah, so like I said, we're hoping that they'll be back sometime this week they, and, and keep praying that they stay safe until they all get back. Um, I don't normally do that. I think I maybe mentioned this on Wednesday night in my Wednesday night uh, small group class, but we don't, we don't normally do this. Last week we had a couple of people join the church, and the reason I bring that up, last week was Celebration Sunday. It was our 33rd birthday as a church. Um, we had some people join, and for six, re six weeks in a row now, we've had somebody in one of the four services join the church. So that's something that's really exciting. And then we had our baptisms last week. We had nine people baptized. Oh, That's, yeah, that's not her fault. She's the fill-in. Uh, those were the videos that I said we were going to watch last week, and then I found out and looked like an idiot when I said, okay, play that video. We don't have that video. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but no, no, no more videos. <laughs> I know. No, it's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, what's funny is none of those were the baptisms from last week. <laughs> But uh, we did have nine baptisms. We had eight reaffirmed. There's a lot of really great things that are happening at this church, and that is something for everybody here to be excited about. So um, that being said, some of the stuff we got coming up, the harvest party on the 27th, it is, it's going to be outside. I think, Amy, I don't want to get in trouble for saying this. I think she's got all the games covered. Um, if you would like to do a game and you didn't get signed up last week, still go ahead and sign up because I think she will find a place for you. Um, the thing that we need the most is candy. So there's a box right over here by the office. If you can bring that in. We, you know, we always joke that we use Methodist math around here. Anybody that slows down long enough to read the sign when they're driving by, we count them on the attendance for Sunday morning. But... <laughs> Um, uh, uh, our real estimation for how many people showed up at the harvest party last year, we, Amy printed up a bunch of sign-in sheets for the, the kids, and I think at 750, they ran out for the second time, and that was just, yeah, it starts at 630, um, but we estimate somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 people were here, so we need a lot of candy. So if you can bring some, that would be great. If you can be a warm body to help pass out some of the candy, that would help too. Um, it, it's, a, it's a great time. Every year we have a bunch of people that have never been here before. They come to the harvest party, and we pick up two or three people that didn't go to church anywhere, and they, for whatever reason, decided that standing out on our parking lot and watching their kids get free candy is why they want to call this church home. So um, like I said, Friday the 27th, starting at 6.30. And then... 
Uh, about a week or two after that, we are going to be having something called Dare to Share Live. This is something that I... Do you have that graphic? I thought it was on there. Maybe not. Okay. Um, this is a... It, the youth event... There it is. I thought we had it. The youth event that we went to in Colorado in, Descent, or in July that uh, Ruby and I and um, Logan allowed some of Barry and I and some of our college kids to go with, with, with their group. And it was such a great thing. Well, they have a one-day event that is live, and it connects to other churches and, and groups like that all over the world. It is November 11th is the World Day of Evangelism. And there's going to be opportunities for us to watch uh, some of these speakers, to worship with uh, literally billions of people all over the planet. But also, we're uh, on occasion, a couple of times that Saturday, we're going to leave the building and we're going to go out and do some actual evangelism. And I last year that Dare to Share Live was my first experience with it, and I, Aaron and I were talking about it the other day, and I said, I remember going to Dare to Share Live and thinking, man, this is awesome. Our whole church should do this, not just the youth. And then we went to the Dare to Share event in Colorado, and, and I'm sold. Like Everything that we're doing that isn't in line with sharing the gospel and gospelizing everybody in our community, we need to just scrap it because it's getting in the way. So, um, I'm sorry? No, this is totally free. The Dare to Share Live is totally free. Can you put that graphic back up there? I'm sorry. Um, if you scan that QR code, the, the only reason that we want you to scan that QR code is so that we know how many people are going to be here so that we can make sure that we can accommodate everybody. We really encourage youth to be here. They're going to be up in the youth room, uh, kind of separate from everybody else. Any adults that want to come, we're going to have it streaming right in here in the big room for as long as we can until the Saturday service starts, and then we're going to figure out what we can do from there. But um, and if you can't be here, you know, it says 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. If you can't be here all day, that's fine. Come for the part that you can be here for, and we're not going to be mad at you if you can't be here for the entire day on a Saturday. I know Saturdays get busy. We're going to have basketball and stuff like that that day. So, um, but it, this is such a great thing. It is totally free, and if you can't figure out how to scan that QR code, we can... Gail's an expert now. She, she figured it out earlier, so... She, Gail will help you. I just threw you under the bus, didn't I? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I can't uh, recommend this event enough. So, totally free, coming up November 11th. In our prayer time, we've, we've had a couple of people in the hospital this week. Tiffany Morris, who is our Sunday night nursery worker, she had a surgery this week. Uh, she's actually back working in the nursery right now, so she's recovered. Steve Horn was in the hospital for a couple of days. He's here with us. We're glad to see him. Uh, Sandra McConnell and James Ernest, as far as I know, they're both still in the hospital. Um, and then one of the babies in our church, Mira Ellis, she went into the ER earlier this week. She has RSV and pneumonia at the same time. So she's home now, but she is um, she's doing some at-home breathing treatments. It's, she's still pretty sick, so keep her in your prayers. Um, also, all of our friends that are over in Israel trying very hard to get home right now. So uh, I know we kind of joke about, uh, we've been making jokes about Chris joining the Israeli army and Johnny Lindsay, our youth minister, being joining the Freedom Fighters and stuff like that. He sent me a picture this morning with one of those Middle Eastern do-rags on. I said, of course, you've already joined the Freedom Fighters. But, um, you know, they, they kind of make light of it, but it is a very dangerous situation. They're in an active war zone right now. So uh, pray very hard to get all of those people home safely and as soon as possible. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy in the way that you provide so many things for us. God, we've had so much to celebrate here at this church for the last several weeks, so much more than normal even. And it's been such a blessing to be a part of it. And we know that all of these good things only come from you. So God, as we enjoy all of these good things that are happening and all of the excitement with the ministry and the evangelism that happens at this church, we take time tonight and we thank you for 
your grace and your mercy because it is because of those things that anything good ever happens. So God, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy and for all of these people that have had physical issues this week, for Tiffany and the surgery that she had, for Steve and Sandra and and James as they're still recovering from different illnesses and ailments. God, we lift them up to you and ask that you would continue to heal their bodies. And we thank you for the way that you've watched over them. God, in a couple of these situations, it is truly miraculous that, that these people maybe are even still here with us. Like the circumstances that it took for these people to get the care that they need in the time that they needed it is nothing short of miraculous. And God, I ask that your spirit would impress that upon all of us so that we don't overlook or take for granted these, these ways that you take care of us. And God, for Mira, we ask for continued healing for her little body and for just peace of mind for her parents and her grandparents. So it's a scary thing when a baby has a breathing issue. So, God, we ask that you would heal her very quickly and, and for comfort for her family. And God, for Chris and Johnny and for all of our members of our family here at the church that are over in harm's way right now, we ask that you would continue to protect them, that you would make their path to get home very straight, and that you would get them home to us very quickly. And God, I know that so many of them are, are being very brave right now, but I know that there's got to be a lot of anxiety. So God, I ask that as they're in an impossible situation, that you would lend them your peace and your comfort as well. And God, again, we thank you for all of the good things that you give us. And we thank you that even as we lift these things up to you, we can know that you are already at work in every one of these situations before we even knew it was an issue, before we knew that there were rockets being shot into Israel, before we knew that any of these people had an illness, you were already at work, already turning things to the good, already protecting. And God, we thank you and praise you for that tonight. So as we take the rest of the time that we have here in your house tonight, I ask that your spirit would aid us in doing everything that we can to glorify you tonight, to worship you and praise you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand now and join in worship. Let mercy fall on me Everyone needs forgiveness The kindness of a Savior The hope of nations Savior, He can move the mountains My God is mighty
to you in your precious and holy name. Amen. I was going to start off tonight with a joke about peer pressure, but I let somebody talk me out of it. Um, conformity, conformity is one of the worst, con, worst parts of the human condition. We we have this kind of instinctual thing where we don't, we don't really want to go against the grain. Yeah, and, and like I said, it's instinctual, so a lot of people are aware of it because it's just kind of something that we understand without really voicing it out loud. But there was a study that was done 70 years ago that was supposed to prove how effective peer pressure is. And the way it worked... They would have two or three people in a room, and they would be sitting at a table, and they would bring in one unsuspecting person that didn't know what was going on. The two, the, the two or three plants, they would be there, and they would know what they were supposed to do. So the setup was uh, the researcher would come in, and he would tell a joke, 
And the punchline of the joke was so stupid and nonsensical that it didn't make sense. And I'm going to be honest, the first time I read the joke that they used for this, it, I even knew that it was, it was supposed to be confusing and not make sense. And I was sitting at my desk getting kind of mad, like, this is so stupid. <laughs> but uh, the point of the study was, once this stupid nonsense punchline gets delivered, all of the plants that are in the room, they will start laughing hysterically. And they wanted to see if the person that didn't know what was happening would laugh along with them, and without fail, every time they did. Um, So, just because curiosity got the better of me, the punchline of this is so stupid that I even feel kind of, I'm a little embarrassed to even say it out loud. Because as somebody that is an amateur comedian, uh, it just... It just rubs me the wrong way. But here's the joke, just, just so you save yourself the trouble of looking it up. Um, so they would walk, they would have everybody sitting down. The researcher would walk in and say, so a horse walked into a bar, and the bartender says, hey, we made a drink named after you. And the horse responds, no soap, radio. And then the people would just start laughing hysterically. And I imagine, like, it, it even says that a lot of times the, the person would kind of look around and then so nobody would think that they didn't get it, they'd just start laughing. And uh, without fail, every single person did it. And the first thing I thought was one of my aunts was not in that study because she does not care that she doesn't get the joke and that she starts laughing five minutes after everybody's gotten it. It's, it's kind of a little family joke if, if Julie just starts laughing... <laughs> then that means that she finally got the joke that everybody's moved past 10 minutes earlier. But, um, you know, we don't like to feel like we're on the outside looking in. Some people will do anything to fit in. Um, Some people, and and that makes sense because God made us to be communal beings. He made us to be part of a community. So some people will do anything to fit in whatever community it is that, that they see themselves in. Some people try very hard to not be overly conformist, at least with certain groups. And, you know, they may look at the mainstream part of the world and they say, well, I don't want to be like that. I'm a nonconformist. But all these people that kind of act like me, I'm going to do everything I can to be like them. So um, everybody kind of does this, just, it just depends on which group of people you want to be with. So everybody kind of conforms like that because nobody wants to be the person on the outside looking in, and that can be a pretty dangerous thing, and I don't think I need to tell anybody that. But there are a couple of places where it really becomes a problem. So in John 12, Jesus is having one of the many... Um, it's not really a discussion, so I hesitate to call it that. This is one of those instances where the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders, that Jesus has just uh, he he has just taught something that was earth shattering to the people at the time. And after he's done that, then these Pharisees, especially, they start asking questions, trying to trip Jesus up or trying to catch him in something so that they can accuse him. It, you know, it's, like I said, it's not a discussion. It is really kind of an inquisition. And in the middle of this, we see that John even quotes the prophet Isaiah saying that these people's hearts have been hardened. And then it goes on, and in verse 42 it says, at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they wouldn't openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved human praise more than praise from God. How sad is that? You know, we we hear all the time that it's the religious leaders that are leading this charge against Israel. And that's something that used to bug me when I would read the Gospels and I would see that these religious leaders are the ones that don't believe that Jesus is who He's saying that He is. And if anybody ever tells you Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah, Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God, they haven't read the book of John because He does several times in the book of John in no uncertain terms. But it it bugged me that these religious leaders weren't, they never got it. I'm like, In my mind, for at least 600 years, 
The people in Israel have had prophets that have told them God is going to send a Messiah. He's going to be a Savior. And these are the things that are going to let you know that the Messiah has come. This is what He's going to do. This is what He's going to say. This is what His ministry is going to look like. And Jesus fit every one of those perfectly. But still, these guys whose whole life and whole life's work was about preparing for the Messiah and knowing when He arrived, when He actually arrived, they're the ones that didn't get it. They didn't understand that it was Jesus. And what we see here in John is that they actually did. They knew exactly who He was. And the people that were with them knew exactly who Jesus was. And these Pharisees were going around saying, you are not going to follow this Jesus guy. Because we have a very delicate power structure that we have built in our little community. And if this Jesus is who he says he is, who we all know that he is, then it's going to upset that and we can't have that. So if you start following this Jesus person, we're going to put you out of the synagogue. You can't be part of the community anymore. And for these Jews in Jesus' day, being part of the synagogue was very much like the church that we have now. It was the center of their lives. It was where their friends were. It was where their families were. It was like all, of the, all of the social calendar that they had for their community. It was centered on what was happening at the synagogue, just like the way we do with the church today. You know, I, I understand this. My friends, my family, they're all here. And our whole social calendar revolves around whatever Amy or Logan have decided to do with our kids. And that, it's so good. Like, if, if, if I'm saying that and that doesn't sound like your life, I'm telling you, you're missing out. If the church isn't the central focal point of your life, then you are missing out on a lot. And I'm not telling you that, that the church is what saves you or anything like that, but what I'm telling you is it's a big part of that abundant life that Jesus promises us. And if you're not taking advantage of that, then, then you're really missing out. But these, pe- and, and these people didn't want to lose that. It was important to them to hang on to this thing that was so central to who they were that even though the truth was staring them in the face, they, di- they, wouldn't, ad- they wouldn't acknowledge it. Because they didn't want to be removed from their place of worship, from their community. And it, like, if that was our context today, it would be something very much like if I stood here right now and I started telling you that Chris and Bob and I, we've decided that at this church, um, there was some crazy event that probably didn't happen 2,000 years ago. And if you guys are going to continue insisting on observing and uh, practicing the elements of Jesus being crucified, dead, and buried, and then resurrected back to life three days later, if you guys are going to insist on continuing to observe that, then we're kicking you out of this church. I mean, what would the answer to that be if I, if, if I started preaching that, or if Chris started preaching that? Yeah. Yeah, I said that in early service, and you know, every other service people said, well, we'd get up and leave. In early service, Pam Dart said, we'd come and get you and throw you out. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> I, I like that answer better. <laughs> yeah, why should you guys leave if I'm the one that's wrong, right? But that's what these people were dealing with. And let me tell you, that's happening in churches today. And it's, it's a horrible thing. And there are people that are in these churches where they are telling you Jesus was not dead and buried or He was not resurrected. It's one or the other. You can't believe in this gospel message that Jesus came and died for your sins and was resurrected back to life because it's not physically possible and we're not going to preach that at this church. And a lot of people do leave, but there are people that because some of these churches are so old and they've been such a part of their family lives for so many generations, they just sit quietly and they say to themselves, I know what the truth is. But this church has been so central to who I am and who my family is for so long. You know, Grandpa built the church. My parents went here and they got married here. This is the church I got baptized in. This is the church I want to raise my kids in. So I'm just going to sit in the back and I'm going to keep my mouth shut because I know what the truth is and I'm going to let this joker stand up there and say what he needs to. But I know the truth. And what I'm telling you is your silence speaks a lot louder than anything that we can say. So 
So when I say, what would you do if I started preaching that sort of nonsense and you guys say, I'd get up and leave or I'd throw your goofy butt out (laughs) and you'd be right to do either one of those things. I firmly believe that everybody here would do exactly that. But what about the rest of the world? What about these people that are in those churches? What about these people that don't even go to church? They're not part of the church. And they say, well, the the church hurt me and I don't want to be any part of it. What about those people? The world is watching us. Whether they want to admit it or not, the world is watching the church and the people that are in the church and our silence speaks very loudly. People don't want to be ostracized. They don't want to be a victim of cancel culture. And if that is a phrase that is unfamiliar to you, cancel culture, it's something that is, uh, it happens more outside of the church, but it happens inside of the church too. And I have seen some pretty nasty examples of that in the last couple of years. But what it means is we, the people in the culture, we decide what it is that you're going to do, think, and say. And if you deviate from what we tell you about how you ought to think or what you ought to say in any way, then you're out. Not only are we kicking you out of our community, but we're going to ridicule you on the way out, and we're going to make sure that no other community will take you in either. We're going to ruin your life because you have to think like we do. How many of you guys have looked around at the world that we live in and thought to yourself, or maybe even said out loud, it seems like the evil in the world is getting bolder? The evil in the world is more out in the open, and it's doing more things than it has ever done before. My, uh, my oldest daughter and I were just having a conversation about this last week. About um, when I was, she's 12 years old. When I was 12, when we would go to my grandma's house in the summer, she lives a block east of the 7th Street Walmart or uh, the Galena Mall, depending on where you live. But when I was a kid, that Walmart wasn't there. It was just woods between her house and Schifferdecker Park over on the west side of town. And just about every day in the summertime, like I said, I was 12 years old. I had a cousin that was a year younger than me, and my brother is two and a half years younger than me. So I was the oldest one, so I was responsible. (laughs) Grandma would give us all 50 cents a piece and say, okay, go to the pool. And we'd ride our bikes over to Schifferdecker Pool, and she would just trust that we made it there. (laughs) And then she would trust that for the two or three hours that we were there that none of us drown. (laughs) And... That's just the way things were. And that blew Abby's mind. She's like, she let you go over there by yourself? It's mind-blowing because she knows my grandma and she knows my mom and she knows how I am. Like We we don't even hardly let them go out in the front yard at our house unless one of us is out there with them because that's the world that we live in today. We used to be able to ride our bikes through kind of a bad part of town and go to a pool in kind of a bad part of town completely unsupervised at 12 years old. You wouldn't dream of doing that today. Especially with girls. But that's the world that we live in. So it looks like evil is getting bolder, but what, what I think is actually happening, evil is not getting bolder, it's getting desperate. Satan knows that he's running out of time. His time is coming short. In fact, Revelation 12 says that. In verse 11, this is a scene that's happening in heaven. It says, They triumphed over Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He's filled with fury because he knows his time is short. He knows that his time is short. His hand is being forced. He has to come out in the open because he's almost out of time. Now, I'm not telling you that the end of the world is just a couple of weeks away or something like that. The the devil's time being short could mean Jesus isn't coming back for another thousand years. But his time is short, and he is out in the open, and he's letting everybody know about it. And it can be... It can be a challenge to be a believer and live in a world where evil is so open and so bold. Because you look around and you feel surrounded by it a lot of times. Sometimes you feel like in whatever setting you're in, you're the only person of faith that might be there. 
I really love reading through the Psalms, no matter what you're going through in life, whether it is a great period in your life where it just feels like everything is clicking and everything's falling into place, or if it's a time when you feel like you are totally alone and maybe God isn't even listening anymore. There is a Psalm somewhere, and most of them are the ones that are written by David. And you can read those and you feel like he is talking about the exact experience that you're going to because the Holy Spirit used a really great literary strategy when, when David was writing these psalms. He never wrote down any kind of reference for what he was going through, what the time period was, what, what thing was happening in his life. We have no idea. He just wrote what he was feeling. So something that he wrote 3,000 years ago is just as applicable to him as it is to us today 3,000 years later. So Psalm 12, it starts out and it says, Help, Lord, because no one's faithful anymore. In some translations, some English translations, and this probably makes more sense to me, it says, Help, Lord, because everyone is godless. Everyone is godless. There's no one faithful, and I'm all alone. Those who are loyal have vanished from the human race. Everyone lies to their neighbor. They flatter with their lips, but they harbor deception in their hearts. Sounds a lot like the world that we live in today. David was surrounded by godlessness and evil, and it was almost overwhelming to him. But David talked to God about it. And David was smart enough to listen. When he talked to God and he told him, I feel like I'm surrounded and overwhelmed by this godlessness and it feels like it's crushing me in from all sides and I don't know what to do, God will respond. And David was smart enough to listen. And he wrote it down in verse 5 here. This is God speaking. It says, Because the poor are plundered and the needy groan, I will now arise, said the Lord. I will protect them and those that, or I will protect them from those that malign them. And because David knows that when God says that he's going to do something, that he can just sit back and rest in God's promise. That's exactly what he says here at the end of this psalm. The last two verses of this psalm say, You, Lord, will keep the needy safe and you'll protect us forever from the wicked who freely strut around when what is vile is honored by the human race. So no matter how hopeless and surrounded and powerless we feel, God's reminding us over and over through Scripture like this, through the way He interacts with us more than anything, that He's overcome the world. Yes, the world is a dark and foreboding place and it seems like the darkness in the world is growing and it's, it's, it's pressing in on us and it's getting closer and closer. But what are we supposed to do about that darkness? What stops darkness in its tracks? Jesus says in John 9, while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Dark, light stops the darkness. Light does not need permission to shine into the darkness. It disrupts the darkness. Jesus is the light that the people living in, in darkness have seen. And then uh, just three chapters later, in John 12, when he's having this, or when John reveals to us that these, these religious leaders know exactly who Jesus is, but they don't want to be put out of the synagogue because they love human praise more than praise from God, what sets them off is Jesus explaining this very thing to them. When he says, I'm the light of the world. In verse 35, he says, it says, then Jesus told them, You're going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before the darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the darkness does not know where they're going. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of the light. Don't let the darkness of the world overtake you. But Jesus says that the light's only going to be with you for a little while. Now, Jesus has been physically gone for 2,000 years. So what are we supposed to do about this darkness? How do we interrupt this darkness now? In Matthew 5, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. You are the one that goes and reflects the light that comes from me, the light of the world. You reflect my light into the world that you live in. He says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. 
Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Light does not need permission to shine into the darkness. You have been given a commission by Jesus himself to go be the light that disrupts the darkness. In 2 Corinthians, Paul picks up on this this theme, and he starts talking about what it means to deal with the darkness and who is living in darkness and who is living in the light. And in, in chapter 4, he says, if our, if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those that are perishing. And what he's talking about, he's making direct reference to Moses when he led Egypt or led Israel out of Egypt. During the Exodus, Moses would go speak to God face to face. Sometimes it was on Mount Sinai, sometimes it was in the tabernacle tent, but Moses would speak to God face to face, and when he came into contact with God, he, it, it would cause his face to shine. Because he had the light of God that was reflecting off of him. He had been in God's presence, and the people of Israel couldn't bear it. They couldn't bear the light of God shining right in their face. So they said, Moses, will you please veil your face? Because it's freaking us out, man. So Moses did. And what Paul is saying here is, if anybody, if this gospel message, if this life-saving message that brings people from darkness to light, that brings people from death to life, if this is being veiled, it's not being veiled to the people that are being saved. It's only being veiled to the people that are in the world and what is causing it to be veiled in their hearts. Paul says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So that they can't see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The God of this world blinds their eyes to the light of the gospel. The God of this world, Satan. That is a weird title for him. And Paul uses titles like that for him on several occasions. He says the whole world follows the darkness that Satan forces upon it. And people happily do it. He, say, he goes on, he says, uh, what we preach is not ourselves, but it's Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God said, let the light shine out of the darkness. And he made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light and knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. You know, we know... I hope we know, we know that we have an enemy that prowls around like a lion, roaring for who he might devour, and it is intended to be something that frightens and unsettles us, but that is not how Satan stalks us, and make no mistake, he's stalking every one of us. Everybody that's here tonight, and more importantly, everybody that's not here tonight, he is stalking every one of us because he wants everyone to have the same faith that he does. So he does it very stealthily with half-truths and lies that sound too good to be true and he lures us away with the things that the world tells us. Because if you don't believe the things that the world tells you, then you're going to be removed from the world that you want to be a part of. If, if you don't follow where the culture is leading you, then you're going to be removed from the culture. And that's not a huge threat to me. It used to be, don't remove me from the culture. That's all that I want is to fit in. But now, I, you know what? I'm not part of your culture, so go ahead and cancel me. I don't care. The world tells us a lot of things. The world tells us a lot about who we are and what our place is in it. And if you don't go along with the way the world tells you things are, then you're going to be ostracized from it. And that is terrifying to some people. So the world tells us about who we are. The world says, you're a cosmic accident. You shouldn't even be here. Everything that you see is just an accident. So anything that you ever make of yourself, then you should pat yourself on the back because you did it yourself. And if... if Somebody got in your way on your way to the success that you're enjoying and you had to, to gain success at their expense, then good for you. Because we're all just a cosmic accident anyway. And we're not going to be here for very long, so get what you can while you can. God says, you're not a cosmic accident. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. 
I knew you when you were in the womb. You're here for a purpose. I know you. So who are you? Who am I? Who are any of us? Individually, who are we? The world says you can be whatever you want to be. Whatever feels good to you right now, then that's what you are, and who is anybody to tell you that you're not? If you feel like you're a girl today, then who's to tell you that you're not? If you're a boy tomorrow, okay, you're a boy tomorrow. If you're a cat on Tuesday, then you're a cat on Tuesday, and any other stupid thing that the world comes up with. And I'm not telling you to go to those people that are dealing with that because those people are hurting very badly. So I'm not telling you to go pick a fight with people and tell them how wrong they are. But the world tells you if you don't want to play pretend with these people that are struggling with some very serious issues, that it's going to ostracize you and it's going to kick you out. God says, I made you male and female in my image. I purposefully made you. When you were fearfully and wonderfully made, I knew what you were going to be, and I did that on purpose. And you're here for a reason, and the way you are is for a reason. And that should be something very comforting. So why are we here? The world says you're here to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. You're just here to do what feels good while you have the ability to do what feels good. And if anybody gets in the way of what feels good for you or what your truth is, you guys know how I feel about that phrase. I absolutely hate that phrase. But if anybody that gets in the way of what your truth is today, they're the ones that are wrong. What does God say about that? God says your, your purpose isn't to feel as good as you can for as long as you can. God says our purpose here is to glorify Him. And how do you glorify God? You live that rich, abundant life that Jesus promises us. You dwell in God's riches, everything that He gives you. And I'm not talking about material wealth and things like that. I'm talking about that abundant life that God gives you where He gives you anything that you need to deal with the world that you live in and to be content and to feel that peace that's beyond all human comprehension. In everything that you do, you have God's riches, and then you share His riches with other people. You share His goodness and His mercy with other people. So it's not going and yelling at people and picking a fight and saying, you know what, you don't think like I do, so we can't like each other. No, none of us think right. None of us have it right. The only thing that's right is God, and I want to share that with you. I want you to know Him the way that I know Him because I used to be as bad off as you are. And the only thing that saved me was Him. You know, we have this idea that there's something wrong in the world. The whole world knows that there's something wrong with the world. Everything is off, something is broken, and it needs to be fixed. We, as followers of Christ, we know what it is that's broken. It's us. There's sin in the world, and we're the ones that let it in constantly. And Christ is what removes it. We know what's broken, but the world looks and they say, something's broken. And we could all be happy if we would just fix a few things. If we would just do these things and everybody could be happy, everybody that should be happy will be happy. So what are these things that we need to remove? The first one's religion. We need to get rid of religion, the world says, because religion is hateful, it's exclusionary, it's hard to follow, people don't like it, it hurts people's feelings, so let's get rid of religion. And while we're at it, we need to get rid of freedom too, because if you exercise certain freedoms, you might hurt somebody's feelings. Who do you think you are to think what you think if it goes against what somebody else thinks? We need to get rid of freedom, and while we're at it, we need to get rid of boundaries too. None of us should be able to say, there's a line that's too far, I'm not willing to cross that. Because it might hurt somebody's feelings, but what does God say? God says, anytime you remove me from any situation, it starts to unravel. It starts to fall apart immediately. And we can look at all of these things in the world that we live in. We can say, you know what? We took prayer out of schools, and now schools are a rough place. We took God out of the government, and now the government is this big, top-heavy, evil thing that, it, that it, it just is in all of our lives in so many different ways, and it shouldn't be there. We can look at those things, and we can complain all day long and point out the problems. But what is the thing that's going to stop that? reflecting the light of Christ with the lives that we live. And how do you do that? With the small little community that you have. You want to protect your kids? Protect your marriage. You take God out of your marriage, it's going to fall apart immediately. 
You take God out of your family, your kids are going to go off the deep end. You take God out of a church, and I've seen this happen. You take God out of a church, it's going to fall apart, and people are going to fight, and people are going to be driven away from God. God says, if you remove me from a situation, it falls apart. So keep God in your family. Keep God in your church. Pray for the people in your church. Pray for your spouse. Pray for your kids. Be the light of the world. The whole world bows down to things like political correctness and godlessness and things like that, and they say, you better do it too. You better bow down, and what God says is when the whole world bows, you stand. Refuse to bow down, and I'm not saying some, something, again, like go out and, and, and start arguments and, and get in people's face. You know, what comes to my mind is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When, when, when Babylon came and took Israel into captivity, one of the first things that Nebuchadnezzar did, the Babylonian emperor, he built this huge statue of himself, and he, he put out this decree that everybody is going to bow down and worship this thing all at the same time to prove your loyalty to me, and you're going to worship me as a god. Now, the people in Babylon, that wasn't hard for them because that's the culture that they lived in. You worshiped your leader. But the Jews that hadn't been there for very long, that was not their culture, but they bowed down and did it anyway because they were trying to save their own skin. So when he had an appointed way that they were going to do it, when all the music started playing, when the flutes and the lyres and and all of the musical instruments started playing, everybody was supposed to bow down, and everybody did. And I always have this picture in my mind of countless thousands of people on this open plain with this big statue, and when everybody bows down all throughout the crowd, everybody's down on their hands and knees, on their face, except for three guys. They're not right together. They're not puffing their chest up and saying, we're not doing it. Go ahead and throw us in the furnace, because that was the option. You either bow down and worship this thing, or you get thrown in a furnace. In my mind, I always picture three guys that are kind of dispersed in the crowd. They're not even close to each other. And they know what it means to stand when the whole rest of the world bows. When the whole rest of the world is kneeling down. And I always just kind of picture them kind of with their arms crossed and their shoulders kind of slumped saying, no, I know what it means for me to stand here to not bow down, but I'm not going to do it because it's not worth losing the relationship that I have with God. One of my favorite verses in the entire Bible, and, and this, this whole story makes me think of it, when Moses had led Egypt, or Israel out of Egypt, and he went up on Mount Sinai, and he was gone for a couple of weeks, and he comes down and they built the golden calf, and he destroys the calf, throws down the commandments. Um, that whole scene, it's all past. And God's not mad, he's disappointed. He's hurt. And he tells Moses, Listen, I made a deal with your forefathers. I told Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that I was going to give the people of Israel this promised land. You, I, I keep my end of the deal. If I say that I'm going to do something, I'll do it. You guys didn't keep your end, but I'm going to keep my end of the bargain. I'm going to send you into this promised land. I'm going to send an angel before you, and he's going to clear it out of all the bad guys that are there. And you're going to go, and it's going to be your place, and nobody's going to remove you from it, but I'm not going to go. You're on your own. You've made your choice, and I'm not going to go with you. And Moses' response to that in Exodus 33, Moses says, if your presence doesn't go with us, then do not send us. Do not send us, because if you're not there, it's not worth going. God, if you send us in there and you're not there, it's not worth going, but if you say that we're going to wander in the desert for 40 years and I'm going to die an old man on the edge, on the border of this promised land, and I'm going to see it, but I'm never going to enter it, but you're with me the whole time, then it's okay. God, if they tell me to bow down and worship this statue and it means being thrown in a furnace, but being thrown in a furnace means that you're going to be in there with me, then let's go. And for all of us, God, if it means me going and sharing my faith with somebody, that, with a neighbor, with a coworker, with a family member, but they're going to ostracize me from my family, they're going to, they're going to 
kick me out of my friend circle. They're gonna, it, it may cost me my job because in some places, sharing your faith with somebody at work creates a hostile work environment. If it means that, then it's okay. As long as I'm with you and I know that where I go is where you want me to be because you're going to be there, then whatever happens to me is fine, even if it means my life. That's the call that we have is to say that anywhere I go, I'm only going if you're going to be there. Anything that I do, I'm only going to do it if you're going to be there. If the whole world bows down and you tell me to stand, I'm going to do it. If the whole world tells me that I have to bow down at the altar of cancel culture or godlessness or whatever, and you tell me not to, then I won't whatever the cost may be. And I'm not telling you that this is some magical formula that's going to keep you free from harm because it won't because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego still got thrown in the furnace. Daniel still got thrown in the lion's den. Paul still got beaten and imprisoned and all the apostles still got executed. Every one of them. Except for John. (laughs) But loving God enough to trust that Christ, to live is Christ and that death is gain and that nothing can snatch you away from his hand will make any trial, anything that the world throws against you, anything that the world does to try to bend your knees and make you bow down, any of those things, when you stand, it'll make it bearable. It'll make it doable. You can overcome because he has overcome the world. And the best thing about standing when everybody else in the world kneels is somebody else might see you standing too, and it might give them the courage to stand with you for the first time. That's what God calls us to do. And I know it's scary. I heard a song last night on the radio, and I thought that's perfect for what I'm going to be talking about today. The chorus of the song says, it gets easier, but it never gets easy. That's our life. It gets easier, but it never gets easy. But it's always good. It's always good as long as you go where God is leading you. Will you please rise for the benediction? Jesus tells us to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, sharing with them all that I've given you, and surely I will be with you until the very end of the age. Amen. Thank you.